Do you understand how arterial lines work? My name is Ken Hoffman. I'm an intensive care specialist at the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne and we're going to review the inner workings of an arterial line. I made this video for those sitting the Australian and New Zealand College of Intensive Care Medicine primary exam to give you a guideline as to the expected level of knowledge. To start with, all medical monitoring systems have four main components. One, a biological variable that we are observing. Two, a sensor watching for changes in that biological variable. Three, an integrator. And four, an output displaying the information. In this case, the biological variable that we are measuring is the arterial blood pressure measured invasively. The first component in the system is an arterial catheter, which is usually relatively short and stiff, made of an inelastic material. This is connected to some stiff tubing, which contains a continuous column of fluid without any air bubbles inside. The reasons for this we'll review later. The next component in the system is a transducer. A transducer is an electrical component which converts one form of energy into an electrical signal. In this case, the form of energy is pressure. The transducer contains a flexible diaphragm, which is pushed up and down by the continuous column of fluid as it moves through the cardiac cycle. On either side of the diaphragm is a component called a strain gauge. A strain gauge consists of a conductive wire which zigzags backwards and forwards. As the strain gauge is stretched, the wire is drawn thinner, which increases the electrical resistance. We can then measure this change in resistance and use it to calculate the pressure which is being applied to the diaphragm. Classically, the strain gauge was integrated into an electrical circuit called a Wheatstone bridge. This was used to measure what was happening to the resistance of the strain gauge over time. Modern arterial line transducers no longer require a Wheatstone bridge to measure the resistance of the strain gauge. They have, however, retained the Wheatstone bridge. In this case, by having two strain gauges on either side of the Wheatstone bridge circuit. This increases the signal to noise ratio and also makes the system independent of temperature, which can affect the electrical resistance of a strain gauge. All right, so now we have turned our pressure waveform into an electrical signal. But what happens next? This is where we need an integrator or computer to process the signal before we can see the output. Before we can display the arterial pressure, we need to make sure that the system has been appropriately calibrated. Calibration is divided into two parts. One, static calibration, and two, dynamic calibration. Static calibration requires two parts. The first is confirming a linear relationship between the actual pressure and the measured pressure by the transducer. On modern arterial line transducers, this is guaranteed by the manufacturer. The second part of static calibration is to zero the transducer to atmospheric pressure at the phlebostatic axis, which is the fourth rib at the mid-axillary line. This is important because a 10 centimetre error in the height of the transducer is equivalent to 7.4 millimetres of mercury. Now we move on to dynamic calibration. This is a little more complex. It is an inherent property of the system and is divided into two parts, resonance and damping. We'll start with resonance. Resonance describes an increase in the oscillations of a vibrating system when energy is applied to the system in harmonic proportion to the natural frequency. The natural frequency of the system is the frequency at which the system will oscillate in the absence of damping. Whoa, were you confused by this? Don't worry, you are not alone. The easiest way to think about this is that we don't want our arterial line system to naturally vibrate at a frequency 
that's close to the heart rate. Normal heart rate that we monitor is between 60 and 180 beats per minute. This is between 1 and 3 hertz. To stop resonance interfering with our signal, the natural frequency of our system has to be 8 times higher, or 8 harmonics above, the frequency we are measuring. If the fastest heart rate we're measuring is 180 beats per minute, that is 3 hertz. If we multiply that by 8, the frequency of our system has to be at least as high as 24 hertz. Remember earlier we wanted to have a short, stiff catheter? Well, that was because the natural frequency of the arterial line system depends on the catheter length, the catheter elasticity, the radius of the catheter, and the density of blood. By using a short, stiff cannula, we can ensure that we have a natural frequency that's much higher than required. Modern arterial line systems have a natural frequency over 200 hertz. The second component of dynamic calibration is damping. Damping is easier to understand than resonance. It reflects a loss of energy in the system which gradually reduces the amplitude of oscillations. Imagine dropping a ball. It never quite gets back to the same height with each subsequent bounce. This is due to a loss of energy in the system. In an arterial line system, there will be some damping in the system due to friction of fluid within the tubing. This is a good thing, so the arterial line is ready to measure the next heartbeat. If we're going to talk about damping, we need to also mention the damping coefficient. This numerically represents the amount of damping present in a system. It is calculated using the ratio of consecutive amplitudes and some fancy maths, although it can also be looked up on a reference table. The optimal amount of damping occurs with a damping coefficient of 0.64. This preserves the frequency responsiveness of the system to react to the next heartbeat without allowing excessive oscillation. If there is too little damping, the pressures will overshoot and the pulse pressure will be exaggerated with a higher systolic pressure and a lower diastolic pressure. The map should be accurate. This occurs with a damping coefficient of less than 0.6. More commonly, in arterial line systems, there is too much damping, or an over-damped system. In this case, the mean arterial pressure will again remain accurate, but the systolic and diastolic pressures will be closer together. This commonly occurs with air in the line, or when long or compliant tubing has been used. The final part of the monitoring system is the output. In this case, it is a graphical representation of the arterial blood pressure waveform with time and a numerical display. So what information do we actually get from our arterial blood pressure monitoring system? The easy ones are the systolic blood pressure, the diastolic blood pressure, the mean arterial pressure and the heart rate. In addition to those, we can calculate the pulse pressure and we can also look for respiratory changes over time. This is called the pulse pressure variation. Some more advanced hemodynamic monitoring systems also use other parameters as surrogate markers. For example, the rate of upstroke on the systolic part of the curve represents contractility. The area under the initial systolic part of the curve is a surrogate marker of stroke volume, and the downslope of the curve is a surrogate marker of arterial vascular resistance. So, to recap what we've been through, all monitoring systems require four main components. One, a biological variable, which in this case is our invasive arterial blood pressure. Two, a sensor, which consists of an arterial catheter, stiff non-compliant tubing, a series of strain gauges integrated into a Wheatstone bridge. 3. An integrator, which takes into account both static and dynamic calibration. 
and four, an output with a graphical representation of our arterial blood pressure with time and numerical representation of our arterial blood pressure. Thank you for listening.